Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to my presentation. Uh, today, I will talk about a first order primary dual algorithm, and I will show applications of this algorithm, uh, which we find quite promising nowadays uh, to complex problems in computer vision. So, what I present here is joint work with Antonin Chambol, mainly for the algorithmic part and the applications part. It is joint work with Daniel Kramers from TU München. Horst Bischoff from ICG, TU Graz, and uh, the students of my research group, Manuel Weltberger, Markus Unger, and Gottfried Graber. Okay, let's jump in. Uh, the plan for today is, first I will give a short introduction about optimization problems. Then I will consider a, sp a specific class of problems, a structured class of convex problems. And then I will present a primary dual algorithm to solve this class of problems. Then I will comment on a recent uh, improvement of the algorithm, uh, which is preconditioning which uh, makes this prime dual algorithm applicable in a plug-and-play fashion, and then I will uh, show a number of different computer vision applications. Uh, let us consider the following very general mathematical problem, uh, optimization problem. So given an objective function f0, uh, we want to minimize this objective function with respect to the unknown vector x, and this optimization problem is subject to a number of constraints, so fi of x less equal than zero. That's, it's not restricted to convex problems, it's just a general uh, optimization problem. And uh, x is of some vector space, capital X. Okay, uh, this seems to be very standard and um, maybe it's naive to think that there should be some, some uh, commercial available package to solve this class of, uh, class of problems because it looks so, so easy and so structured. However, when you type this problem in Google, you will not find a commercial package which solves this problem. The reality is quite different. Finding a solution to this very general class of uh, uh, optimization problems is far from being trivial. So, uh, Jure Nesterov in his book on convex optimization says, optimization problems are unsolvable in general and everyone should to be aware about this. That Optimization is really difficult and there's only a very small class of problems, problems which we can solve actually. Uh, let me show another slide about the complexity bounds for global optimization. Global optimization means give me optimization problems, you're interested in the globally optimal solution. So let us restrict to the following class of problems. We want to minimize an arbitrary objective function uh, in an n-dimensional unit cube. So the, the cube is given here, so just each dimension of this unknown vector x is between 0 and 1, it's just a unit hypercube. Uh, of course, we could ask, what is the lower complexity bound to find an epsilon accurate solution to this class, complete class of problems? Uh, so we are not interested in really the global optimum, just we are, uh, it would be sufficient to have an epsilon accurate solution with respect to uh, the objective function. And Nesterov showed in his book, in the same book, that uh, for L half larger than epsilon, L is the Lipschitz constant of the objective function, so a bound on the maximum steepness of F. Uh, the complexity of any zero order method to find an epsilon accurate solution is at least, so it's the lower bound, of L over two epsilon to the power of N. N is the number of unknowns. So that means, for example, if you have a very moderate Lipschitz constant, so it's not moving too heavily, this function. Let's say L is 2, and we require an accuracy of epsilon is 1%, and we have only 10 unknowns. That means 2 over 2 is 1, over 1% 1 is 100, 100 to the power of 10, only 10 unknowns, is 10 to the power of 20 function calls, at least, to solve this class of problems. So that's really, yes? Why does that come into it? Couldn't you just enumerate? Sorry, what, what do you mean? Why, why does L feature? Yeah, uh, this is uh, because, of, because uh, you restrict it to zero order methods. That means it's nothing else than a complete search. And in order to, to uh, set up the grid for this complete search, you need to know how 
fast is this function moving? This is exactly what the Lipschitz constant gives you in this case here. But if you did zero steps and you had a grid of density 1 over 2 epsilon to the n, yeah. you would then get an epsilon accurate solution by just enumerating uh, yeah, it depends on, on how fast is this, um, uh, this function moving. Because if L is very large, that means it can move quite a lot. And if it's only uh, smoothly is moving... Is epsilon in F or in X? Epsilon is in F. In F? Yes. yes okay. It's a accuracy with respect to the objective function here, yeah. So you, you need somehow to yeah. uh, combine X with the function values, and this is exactly given by the Lipschitz constant here. And so that... That means any zero order method cannot be faster for this complete class of problems, of course, not for, for uh, special cases, than this bound here. That means 10 to the power of 20 function calls. So on a standard computer, it's uh, 30 million years. Only 10 unknowns. And the amazing thing is that this bound cannot be very much improved by higher order methods. That means uh, first order, second order methods, uh, gradient descent, Newton methods, because you don't have any, any structure available for this for this type of problems here. I suppose that is exactly one problem. Epsilon is on F. Yes. And is that useful? Yes. It's useful, yes. But for a lot of our problems, we really care about getting X close enough. You're right, and, uh, but there's no chance to rewrite it in terms of X sometimes. So when you, when you uh, look at these uh, conversions rates of, of Nesterov and so on, this is always in, in the function, in the objective function. You care about the energy being minimized, yes. as in F here. But often you don't care about the value of the energy. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah, you want the solution that is close enough yeah. to the optimum of the function. In X. But you want to... I want the image that looks nice. No, no, the comment is, is, is a good comment, because sometimes it could be that uh, uh, although you are only an epsilon away from the optimal energy, the solution can change quite a lot. So there's no, no guarantee that the solution always is, is somehow related to the sure. gap of the energy. But once again, if you don't trust the F as in your energy model, then use a different technique. <laughs> you, you can trust your F, but uh, for non-smooth problems, there's no guarantee. So for example, you can, maybe you can set up a graph cut problem where only for a very small difference in energy, the, the solution might change quite a lot. But there's no chance to, to write this bound in terms of X here. But for smooth problems, it's different. I will show it in the talk later on. OK, let me comment a little bit about convex versus non-convex problems. So this class uh, now considered on the last slide is, of course, a non-convex class of problems. Uh, so what's the differences here? Unfortunately, non-convex problems uh, often give more accurate models. So when you try to model some, some problem, then it's uh, often more easier to think in terms of non-convex model because humans tend to think in, in hidden variables. So this exactly leads to non-convex problems. However, in general, there's no chance to find the global minimizer. And also, the result strongly depends on initialization. Of course, if you're very close to the optimum solution, then uh, you will maybe find the global minimum, but it very much depends on the initialization. And there's always the dilemma when working with non-convex problems, do you have the wrong, wrong model or is, is it just subject to the optimization procedure? So maybe if I could find the global problem, would this be the desired result or is the model wrong? So there's always this dilemma. And for convex problems, it's different. They are often inferior to non-convex models, but very often you know what, what, what are your basic approximations. So for example, you know, okay, I, I did a linearization of this thing and the approximation here and the relaxation there. So you know that it's not maybe the best solution, but you know what's going on. So you can really analyze with what's your minimizer giving you and so on. And of course, uh, any locally minimizer of a convex optimization problem is a global minimizer and it's independent of the initialization. However, uh, one should be aware that convex does not mean easy. So you could very easily construct a convex optimization problem which has exponentially many unknowns. So and this is then, of course, a very difficult problem as well. So let me consider, therefore, the following structured class of convex optimization problems we will work on in uh, on the next slides. It's given by the objective function which consists of two terms, f and g, and there is a linear operator k involved, and x is the unknown vector. So k is a linear operator from one vector space, one Hilbert space x, to another Hilbert space. Hilbert space means basically a complete vector space with an inner product. Uh, 
Uh, <clears throat> and f is a mapping of the vector space y to r, including infinity, so also functions which have infinity as a function value are allowed, and the same is here for g. And f and g are convex, lower semi-continuous functions, and the main assumption we do here is that f and g are simple. That means we have an idea uh, of the structure of f and g. So we, for example, it could be a sum over small functions. So we uh, assume that they are a simple function and with known structure. And simple, more precisely, means that uh, they have an easy to compute proximity operator. The proximity operator is an auxiliary optimization problem where you don't want to minimize the complete energy, f plus g, you just want to minimize one of these two terms, for example, g plus something quadratic, or only f plus something quadratic. And the solution to this auxiliary optimization problem is called the proximity operator. Proximity, therefore, because uh, z is fixed and you are only allowed to move in the proximity of z with x, but uh, you at the same time aim at minimizing one of these two terms. And therefore, it's called proximity operator. And in operator a notation, it is written in this fancy way here. So this is just this is equivalent to the argument that minimizes this optimization problem here. So it turns out that many standard problems can be cast in this framework here. So one of the most simplest toy problem is ROF. Image denoising. It has been introduced by Rudin, Osha, Fatemi in 1992 for uh, edge-preserving image denoising, and I, I'm sure many of you know this model here. And the model consists of exactly two terms. One here is the L1 norm of the image gradient. So two, one means it's the two norm with respect to the length of the gradient, and the one norm with respect to the uh, domain of the image. And it has a quadratic data term, so f is the given possibly noisy data. So that means you want to find a very close approximation to f, but which should have uh, low variation measured in terms of, of this L1 norm of the gradient here. So now we can try to cast this in, in, into the class of problems I've mentioned in the previous slide. It's easy to see that x is just r to the power of n, assuming n pixels, y is x times x, x is u here. The linear operator is the Nabl operator. It's just a, a, a huge matrix, a sparse matrix, where there are some finite differences approximation of the gradient inside. f is exactly this 2-1 norm, and g is the quadratic L2 norm here. So therefore, uh, the proximity operators are very easy to compute. For f, it's a pointwise sum of a quadratic function plus this 2 norm here. And this is well known that this can be solved by a pointwise shrinkage operation, soft shrinkage. And for g, the proximity operator is the sum of something quadratic pointwise plus something quadratic pointwise, and that's very, very easy. So you can really solve this very efficiently pointwise. That means pointwise for each pixel in your image. So another uh, different, uh, important class of problems is the so-called basis pursuit problem in compressed sensing, which also fits into this class of problems. Uh, the idea here is that you have given some noisy measurement vector b, and you have given a basis, for example, a wavelet basis, and you want to find an approximation of b in this basis, and x is the coefficient vector with respect to this basis, and here the L1 norm is used to have a sparse representation. So that's the basic idea of, of these reconstruction algorithms in compressed sensing. Another class of problems which is exactly can exactly be cast in this class of problems is uh, a linear support vector machine. So I think you are all familiar with linear support vector machine. So you're looking for a hyperplane, W, and, and your bias, such that this hinge loss here, which is a non-smooth function, is minimized. And of course, this is a regularization term for W, so that the uh, vector W should be as small as possible. This can exactly be written or cast in this class of problems. And Last but not least, general linear programming problems exactly fit into this class of problems. So here you have this linear objective function, and this is subject to equality constraints and this positivity constraints. Or you could consider uh, inequality form. It's, it's everything the same because it can be converted from one form into the other form. OK. So uh, the most important concept in convex optimization is duality. 
And duality comes through a different concept. You, you can uh, derive it through different concepts. One is the so-called convex conjugate function. So given a function f of x, you can uh, compute the convex conjugate f star of y, which is given by this transformation here. That's the legendre fenchel transform or legendre Rockefeller transform or also called convex conjugate. And the important thing here is if f of x is a convex lower semi-continuous function and you apply this transformation twice, you again uh, get back your, your original function f of x. And if f of x is not convex, then you, and you apply this uh, transformation twice, you get back the, uh, the largest convex hull over your non-convex function. So our initial problem, which I call now the primer here, was exactly this objective function if f k x plus g of x. And I apply this formula to the first term here, then I arrive at the so-called primer dual formulation. You now see I did not touch g of x, it's the same. I just applied this transformation to f here, which gives me this term minus this term here. So this is called now the primer dual, because y is the dual variable, and you have both the primer and the dual in your objective function. This is now no longer a minimization problem, it's now a settle point problem, because you minimize in x and maximize in y. And doing the same for g, I arrive at a so-called dual problem now. So f star and g star are now the, the conjugate functions of f and g, and y is the dual, and k star is the adjoint operator of k, so in, in our terminology it's just a matrix transpose here, because we have real numbers here. So the good thing about this transformation <coughs> is uh, that we can now compute the so-called duality gap, which is exactly the difference of the primal ob objective minus the dual objective here. And it is known that if the primal dual gap vanishes, we have found an optimal primal dual pa pair x and y. Of course, given that f and g are convex functions. Otherwise, only weak duality will hold. So in our work, we uh, focus on the primal dual formulation. So we don't use the primal, neither the dual. We just take this in-between thing because it gives us access to the primal and the dual. And sometimes it makes it easier to find relaxations of non-convex problems. So here's again the primal dual formulation or the settle point formulation. Uh, and a settle point has to fulfill the following Euler-Lagrange equations, which is simply the, the functional derivative res with respect to y here, gives kx plus uh, minus uh, subgradient of f star of y, and zero should be contained in this set here, and the same for the primer. And if zero is contained in this set on the left-hand side, then we have found a settle point. So, this is a little bit fancy, so normally when, when minimizing a function you say, okay, it's equal zero, but you should be aware that we don't deal with uh, differentiable functions. We can also have non-differentiable functions, then we need the uh, notion of subgradient, which is not a single value, which is a set of different gradients. So it basically it's a set of hyperplanes. Therefore, on the left-hand side here is a set, because this is a set here. And as long as zero is contained here, then we found a settle point. So this is an example for a settle point. So you uh, minimizing here the primer and maximizing the dual here, and here is the settle point to decide. So it's a stationary point here. Could you possibly put on board that in terms of gradients for a differentiable function? Yeah, it's just equal zero. Here you have the gradient, and here equal zero. So you replace the delta with a map one. Yes, exactly. And replace the element with an equal. Yes. Okay. So um, for this class of problems, a number of different uh, methods exist which, which can be used to solve this class of problems. Uh, one of these earliest uh, algorithms is the so-called Arrow-Hurwitz algorithm for finding settle points. It dates back to 58. And uh, if you don't know, Arrow and Hurwitz are both Nobel Prize winners. And the funny thing is, uh, Hurwitz, I think, got his Nobel Prize in economy. Uh, when he was 90 years old, so it was 2007, so <laughs> it's amazing. Uh, one of the most general algorithms is the so-called proximal point algorithm, 
which has been studied or introduced by Martinet and then more deeply developed by Rockefeller and Merci Lyon. And this is a very general algorithm which can be applied to very uh, general class of convex problems. But the problem is that it's rather conceptual, so it's not implementable, the algorithm, because each step of the proximal point algorithm is as difficult as the problem itself. Uh, but there exist some splitting techniques based on the proximal point algorithm. For example, the ADMM, alternating direction method of multipliers, which is equivalent to the augmented Lagrangian approach, or recently called the uh, split Bregman algorithm. Maybe you heard about it. They are all equivalent to splittings based on this proximal point algorithm. And there is this class of so-called extra gradient methods introduced by Kopelevich and Popov and then uh, more deeply studied by Nemirovsky quite recently. And of course, uh, there is this uh, very uh, well-known Nesterov's method, which has now been applied to different uh, problems in science, to machine learning, to computer vision, and, and even other types of problems, uh, which can also be applied to this class of problems. But the idea here is that it doesn't work on the non-differentiable function. You have to apply some smoothing step before and then to solve this smooth approximation. So uh, in our work, we propose the following first order primal dual algorithm. So it's very easy, it only has two steps. So first we have to choose uh, two time steps, the primal time step tau and the dual sigma, larger than zero, of course. Then we have to choose some parameter theta, let us fix it to one here, and some initialization, which is arbitrary. It even doesn't have to be feasible here. And then the duration iterations are the following. We update xn and yn as follows. So yn plus 1 is given by some gradient sn here using a linear operator and then applying the proximity operator with respect to f star. And then you do the same gradient descent now because in the primary we minimize with respect to the adjoint operator and using this point from the previous, sorry, previous iteration, and then apply the proximity operator again. So it's just basically alternating gradient ascent in the dual and gradient descent in the primary. So one thing very important here is that we don't take just the point xn from the previous iteration. We take a linear combination of n and n minus 1 here. And this is very important to ensure convergence of the algorithm. It can be seen as an over-relaxation. So normally, if you alternatingly minimize in the primary and uh, maximizing dual, one will always be behind the other. So maybe the primary is, is one step before the dual. And using this extrapolation here, you ensure that both run at the same time, so that there is a concurrent minimization and maximization in the primary and the dual. Yes? So your speed constant or parameter theta is something that you choose by hand and should be related to the big L constant that we saw earlier. You mean tau and sigma? Theta. Theta is fixed. How do you fix it? Uh, it has to be equal to 1 to uh, proof convergence. So when you, when you uh, try to prove convergence of this algorithm, you see that theta has to be equal to 1. So why did you write this as theta value 1? Uh, because uh, for, a, for other classes of the problems, this is for the complete class, where you have something smooth, then we uh, found the acceleration where the theta actually varies. So, but for, for the plain algorithm, which can be applied to, com to the complete class of problems, you need theta equals 1. And tau and sigma are chosen such that tau times sigma times this squared operator norm of your linear operator is less than 1. So just the product of both times this should be less than 1. But you're free to choose the ratio of, of those two here. Okay? Does this have any relationship to the successive over-relaxation algorithm? Uh, yes, because this is an over-relaxation here. Exactly, yes. It's a relation, yeah. But it's hard to say that it, it's the same. So it's not, here it's not for making it faster like in the SOR. Here is it that you uh, extrapolate your primer that it is at the same time step as the dual such that it's not running behind the dual all the time. Otherwise, you would already get this zigzagging at the end. So you really need this for convergence here. 
And you can derive this algorithm by means of a, a preconditioned uh, augmented Lagrangian, and then this factor theta equals one comes directly out. So it's not just uh, hand chosen. So you can derive it from a, another different algorithm, then you see exactly that theta is equal to one here. Okay. So what we proved in the paper is uh, that it gives different conversions rates, some in the terms of the objective function, some in terms of x. So coming back to your comment, uh, by non-empirical choices on tau sigma and theta. So if f star and g are non-smooth, that means there's really a complete class of problems, we have convergence in terms of the objective function of order 1 over n, where n is the, uh, the total number of iterations. So starting with initial error, you can say that the gap decreases with this order here. That means if, if, if I'm in interested in an in epsilon accurate solution, I need uh, 1 over epsilon iterations to find this solution here. Uh, and for this convergence here, for this class of problems, theta is fixed to 1. And tau and sigma are arbitrary. Just the, the, um, this restriction that the product should be smaller than some value has to be fulfilled. So if one of these two terms are uniformly convex, so it's related to strictly convex, then we can show that we have actually a faster convergence, which is order of 1 over n squared, but now not for the objective function, but now for your unknown vector here, for the squared L2 norm here. That means if you want to have an epsilon accurate solution of, in terms of x, you need uh, 1 over square root of uh, epsilon iterations. Uh, sorry, square root of epsilon iterations. No, uh, 1 over square root of epsilon so <laughs> iterations. And finally, if both terms are uniformly convex, that means you have really a smooth differentiable problem, then we actually find linear convergence here. So that means convergence is in terms of omega to the power of n, n is the number of iterations, and om is omega is uh, less than 1. That means the improvement in each step is the same exactly omega. And this is again for the squared arrow uh, x minus the optimal solution x hat here. Yeah? In the first time, it's also convex, right? It's always convex. So this is this class of problems where f and g are convex. But sometimes it might be differentiable. So like a, a squared data term is differentiable, but the total variation or L1 norm is non-differentiable. So depending on the uh, type of problem, you, you end up with different guarantees for your convergence here. Is L1 uniform convex? No. L2 is. So um, our convergence rates we obtained for the primal dual exactly coincide with the best known rates of all these uh, algorithms of Nesterov, Nemirovsky, Bektibu. But they, uh, it's important to note that they have different algorithms to achieve this, and we can achieve all these uh, convergence rates with uh, basically the same algorithm. So it automatically somehow adapts to the, to the smoothness of the problems and gives you the best convergence rate here. So, but it's not, it's not known if there is a first or a method which, which can be faster than ours, but these are currently the best known rates we exactly achieve with this algorithm. So for details I refer to the paper, which can be downloaded from my homepage. So uh, let me now present some performance evaluation of this algorithm exactly for these three cases of different smoothness. The first one is again the ROF model, as mentioned before. This is something non-smooth, non-differentiable, and this is something smooth. So we have the sum of something smooth plus something non-smooth. Therefore, we can apply this accelerated algorithm, which gives us 1 over n squared. This is just the example image used. This is the clean image, the noisy image, and this is a typical result of ROF denoising. So here are the numbers. We evaluated the algorithm for different uh, strength of the noise and therefore different regularization parameters here. Lambda 16, which is a stronger data term, and here is lambda 8. Less strong data term means more regularization. And we evaluated it for different accuracies here for, for a given uh, ground truth solution. So the ground truth solution was produced running one algorithm for hundred thousand of iterations. So uh, one can see that for stronger regularization, the algorithm, all algorithms need more iterations, and 
of course, if you require a higher accuracy, then you need also more iterations. So the fastest method so far is still... Sorry? Epsilon here is defined as the distance between Cromwell and Duo. No, epsilon here is the distance to the ground truth solution, so in, in terms of x, so, or here in terms of u. So you really pre-compute the optimal solution, which is unique here, therefore it's okay. But sometimes it might not be unique, so then you cannot use it. And then you measure it's just, uh, it's just the RMS uh, root mean squared error. And, this, and is that per pixel or times the number of pixels? This is per pixel. And zero to one image? Yes. So each pixel is, uh, you, is accurate up to this arrow here. Yes, reasonably accurate. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, there's one algorithm which is based on this arrow Hurwitz method, which is still the fastest one. You see here 65 iterations, here 600, here 105, 1,000 iterations. But uh, this method cannot be proven to converge within uh, this accuracy here. So it, it has the same asympt asymptotic uh, convergence rate, rate like 1 over n squared, but it, there's no chance to prove it. So different people tried it, so it's still unknown. But empirically, it's very, very fast. But this, can, this algorithm can only be applied to this specific problem. When you apply it to a non-smooth problem, then it stops working. And our algorithm is approximately as fast as very well established methods like FISTA of Beck and Taboo and Nesterov is a little bit slower than FISTA, but it's slightly outperforms FISTA and Nesterov. So you can see here 108, a little bit slower, but here a little bit faster, again a little bit slower and, and for higher accuracy a little bit faster. So it, it really equals established methods. So now let's try to do a similar experiment for a completely non-smooth problem. Now it's TVL1 denoising. I'd also be familiar with this type of denoising. It's known that TVL1 denoising is well suited if you have uh, strong outliers in your data term. So dealing with a lot of noise and strong noise like occlusions or uh, speckle noise or whatever. So here you have a clean image. This is some noisy image with salt and pepper noise. And this is what ROF gives you. You see it's oversmoothed and still have outliers inside. And this is what TVL1 gives you here in this case. So this is again the example image used in the evaluation. And we did a similar comparison with uh, state-of-the-art methods. And it turns out that the primal dual algorithm is much faster here with, uh, compared to alternating direction method of multipliers. This is the split Bregman method uh, or the extra gradient method of uh, nest. Uh, Kopelevich and the Nesterov smoothing method here. So it's quite disappointing that the Nesterov smoothing method here is very, very slow. The problem is the smoothing has to be in the order of your accuracy and just smoothing the L1 norm just with this small epsilon here makes this Nesterov algorithm really, really uh, uh, slow here in this case. And we don't need any kind of smoothing. So the smoothing is in the algorithm itself somehow included. So, and finally, uh, a problem where both terms are smooth. This is, for example, given by the Huda, uh, Huba ROF denoising model. So here you have the squared data term again. And here you have a smooth approximation of the L1 norm, simply Huba function, which is uh, quadratic here for small values and, and linear for larger values. And therefore, both terms are smooth. And we can apply the linear <laughs> convergent algorithm. So it's a comparison between ROF and Huber, you see this blocky artifacts of ROF denoising, which comes from this total variation regularization. And since the Huber uses some smooth approximation, gives you more smooth results. It also looks a little bit more natural here in this case. And we compared it to some Nesterov method. And as you can see, it's much faster here. So for a very, very accurate solution, now it's, it's really machine precision. So this is where MATLAB stops working here with this accuracy here. And it takes only 187 iterations. So um, when you look at this, these timings here, this is these all refer to plain MATLAB implementations. You can easily parallelize it on a GPU, gives you a speed up of 300, 500, depending on your GPU. This also applies to Nestrov and the other methods we tested as well. Yes? Is that error between the DNA? Sorry? 
the epsilon is uh, the accuracy between your pixel value and the ground truth pixel value. So in this, in this example, would that correspond to the difference between A and D? No, between D and D run for the iterations. What do you mean with D? Uh, figure D, figure D. Ah, no, no, this is just the comparison between ROF and Huber. So the, the, what, this is just to, to show the effect of using a smooth approximation of the total variation instead of the pure total variation, just to show the effect, what you lose or win when you do this, this smoothing of the L1 norm. But the question was, what is epsilon? And it's the difference between D. No, no, epsilon is the accuracy of, of your solution so when running the algorithm for the Huber model. So for example, yeah. these images, how would I compute epsilon? Uh, you use a different method or one algorithm with a very large number of iterations to produce the ground truth solution. So and then you measure... Is not the ground truth algorithm. Sorry? Is A not the ground truth? No, because you, uh, you have noise in... There's no denoising algorithm which gives you this here, only an approximation. So it's not... Well, now, now we're a little bit lost, I think. What, what is the ground truth? So the, ground truth the ground truth is the... Ground truth of the algorithm. The minimizer of your energy. It's the oh, minimizer the of this the energy here. Minimum. Sorry? The global minimum, exactly, yes. So can we see the global minimum as an image? Yes, of course. It's an image which... Do you have it? Yeah, it looks exactly like this. So <laughs> I, don't, <laughs> I don't think you see the difference of, of 10 to the power of minus 15. So. That's, what, that's why we have, we have been asking these questions, because... Okay, I misunderstood you. I guess the relevant question might be, how many iterations would you have to run it before it would look just like just like the, yeah, maybe a accuracy of uh, 0.001 is enough. Yeah, so how many iterations do you think that would take on this table? Yeah, when you refer to this table here, you have 10 minus 4, then okay, maybe 40, 50 iterations. So very, very fast. So having in mind, then on a GPU, you can do 10,000 iterations per second, for example. So that's the good thing about the algorithm, that each iteration is very, very fast. Yeah, okay, you need maybe many iterations, but each iteration is very, very fast. i come back to this point later. So, sorry, so, sorry. Go ahead. So, so Thomas, uh, Tom, you, you, uh, you said that epsilon approximation is on the functional value of uh, <coughs> the ground, of the global optimum. And now you are saying the epsilon approximation is on x. When you go back... Only for the non-smooth case, it's in terms of the function values. Okay. Here is it in terms of your unknown. Okay. Oh, because but yeah, for the non-smooth case, there's, there's no chance to write it in terms of, because yeah, I as explained before. Yeah. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about parallel computing? So the algorithm basically in each step computes matrix vector products with usually a very, very sparse matrix. So it's very easy to parallelize it uh, therefore, the processor of my dreams looks like this. I would like to have uh, one simple processor for each pixel, maybe. And each processor only has a very small amount of memory, storing the prime and the dual value here. And each processor should be uh, able to interchange data according to the structure of your linear operator. That means, for example, only with your neighboring pixels. This would be a very, very nice processor. So you could have, for each pixel, one processor, and then you could do one primary dual step completely in parallel. So, and recent GPUs very much go into this direction. So therefore, this algorithm is very, very well suited to be implemented on, on the GPU. So uh, state-of-the-art GPUs have about 500 cores. That means I can update 500 pixels at the same time. So there's still room for improvement for the algorithm, namely, if the linear operator K has an irregular structure, that means not this nice structure given by uh, finite differences, approximation, or wave flat. If it's really bad, so for example, one column is completely dense, the next column is sparse, or, or whatever. Or uh, the operator K is badly scaled. Some entries are in the range between zero, uh, zero and one. Some are in the range between zero and 10 millions. Then the performance of the algorithm drops down. And uh, the operator norm, which is necessary to bound the time steps, is very hard to estimate if the structure is very irregular. That's another point. Second, uh, 
the global steps tau and sigma that are just scalar valued steps uh, might not be able to adapt to this uh, more complicated structure of your linear operator. And this motivates the study of preconditioning techniques for the primal dual algorithm. So it, it goes like this. Thanks to this paper here uh, of He and Yuan, it was uh, only a few months ago, they showed that our primal dual algorithm is a special instance of this proximal point algorithm. Maybe you remember I mentioned this is this non-implementable algorithm. They showed that this is just a, a clever splitting of this proximal point algorithm. And uh, the iterations of the proximal point algorithm can be written at the following variational inequality. That means doing one step in the primal and the dual means solving this variational inequality here for x n plus 1 and y n plus 1. So meaning finding this x n plus 1, y n plus 1 such that it's larger or equal 0 is doing one step of the primal dual algorithm. It's just rewriting the iterations in a, in a, in a fancy way here. And what is included here is this iteration matrix M. And for the primal dual algorithm presented before, M looks like this. You have here the joint operator minus k star. And you, here you have minus theta times k. And here you have 1 over tau times identity and 1 over sigma times identity. So and now it is known, like this can be seen as a, as a norm in this matrix M here, that convergence is ensured as long as M is symmetric and positive definite. So for, for uh, uh, constructing norms, you always need this condition on, on your matrix here. And now, coming back to your question, now you see that if theta is not 1, then this is surely not symmetric. So theta has to be 1 such that this thing here is symmetric. And of course, this is some diagonal matrix, diagonal matrix, so we are done. And I should note that for the accelerated versions where theta is allowed to change dynamically, so I did not show the thetas, but you can look it up in the paper, then it's no longer a proximal point algorithm. But it's the plane algorithm with theta equals 1, this algorithm, the primal dual algorithm, is exactly an instance of the proximal point algorithm. So what do we need? We need that this is symmetric when theta 1 we find, and it should be positive definite, and it's not difficult to show that uh, this matrix is positive definite exactly when tau times sigma times the squared operator norm of k is less than 1. It's exactly the condition we had in the paper. So it can be recovered from a different viewpoint here. So now the basic idea is... Sorry, so just something. Yes. Um, there are many solutions to the inequality. Is it, if you choose any feasible point? Yes. You can, you can choose any. Right. It doesn't yes. have to be on boundary. No. You just have to fulfill this, this variation of inequality here. So the basic idea of the preconditioning now is why not to replace your scalar valued primal dual steps tau and sigma by positive definite symmetric matrices tau and sigma. So that means we replace this iteration matrix M of the original algorithm of our first paper by this matrix here where now we have here uh, the matrix tau and the matrix the inverse of the matrix sigma here. So the intu intuition behind this is that using here a matrix and here a matrix instead of scalars, we have much more degrees of freedom, which gives us some chance to improve the convergence of the algorithm. So uh, the preconditioned primal dual algorithm now looks like this. It's just the same algorithm. And instead of having here the time steps sigma, we have the matrix here, here the matrix, here the matrix, and here the matrix. Otherwise, the, the algorithm is exactly the same. So now it's, of course, the, the question is uh, interesting. Uh, what should tau and sigma fulfill such that uh, the algorithm converges? And it turns out that convergence can be ensured if theta equals 1, as before, to make it symmetric here. Tau and sigma are symmetric and positive definite. And square root of sigma times k times square root of tau squared should be less than 1. And now it's very easy. If you replace here sigma and tau by this matrix, you exactly rec recover this condition here. It's the same condition written in matrix form here. OK, now we, we know uh, having these matrices, we can ensure convergence, which, ensure, uh, which uh, obey 
this uh, uh, inequality here. And the question is now how to choose segment tau. And this is very important uh, because uh, the preconditioners should be chosen such that the proximity operators are still easy to compute. This was the main assumption of the algorithm that these proximity operators are easy to compute. And therefore, uh, from now on, we'll restrict our preconditioning pre matrices to diagonal matrices. That means that we now have one time step for each dimension of the problem. So for each entry of the vector x and the dual vector y, we have one time step. In general, the algorithm converges for a complete matrix, but then the proximity operators are more difficult to compute. In some special cases, we have some ideas how to use a complete matrix, but from now on, let us stick to diagonal matrices here. And uh, what we showed in our work is that if you choose tau and sigma exactly like this, uh, then you can ensure convergence. So what does this mean? K is your linear operator, it's a matrix. You choose the jth entry of tau as uh, the, the norm of the jth uh, column of K, one over the <laughs> norm of the jth column of K, and you choose the eth entry of sigma, of the vector sigma here, as the norm of the eth row of k. You just you take your matrix, compute column-wise norms with respect to 2 minus alpha and alpha, and row-wise norms, and 1 over these norms exactly give you the time steps. And what we show is that exactly this choice for the preconditioning ensures the important inequality such that the algorithm converges. So for example, choose alpha equals to one, then you have exactly here the L1 norm and here the L1 norm. That's basically what we use. Okay, that, that means uh, the good thing about this preconditioning is that you can really use the algorithm in a plug and play fashion. Given a problem with a linear operator, I compute uh, column-wise norms, row-wise norms, this gives me the time steps and I no longer have to estimate the operator norm of K or somehow choose my time steps here. So there was a surprise when doing this, uh, that there's a very strong connection to a very old method with this preconditioning, namely the uh, alternating step method of uh, Jonathan Eckstein and Pertekas. They considered a subclass of problems, the so-called monotropic programs, consist of the following uh, thing. You minimize an objective function which is some, something convex, subject to these equality constraints here, okay? And you can rewrite this uh, by means of a settle point problem, you end up with this formulation here. And it's easy to see that this is exactly one instance of, of the settle point problems we consider here in this talk today. And uh, it turns out that when I use alpha equals to zero, the preconditioned primal dual algorithm is exactly the alternating step method of Eckstein of, of 1990. That was quite a surprise. So what does alpha equals zero mean? Here it's easy, it's, here's the squared norm, but here you have to the power of zero, it's simply the number of non-zero entries in the eth row of your matrix. But it turns out that different choices for alpha, we use alpha equals one, perform better in practice. So therefore the alternating step method can be recovered as a special case of this preconditioned primal dual algorithm here. So uh, here's a, a short evaluation on general linear programming problems where we compare the primal dual algorithm, the standard of the first part, then the preconditioned primal dual algorithm, and we used just one interior points over here. So uh, we used three LP test problems and the error threshold was 10 to the power of minus four. This was basically the, uh, the normalized primal dual gap. It's the same what MATLAB's interior point solver is using. So we have three problems. One is called SC50B. You can find it in MATLAB. It's included in MATLAB. And it's a very small LP problem, only 48 variables, 30 inequalities, and 20 equalities. The second one is a badly scaled problem where you have a dense column. Therefore, it's called dense columns. And slightly more variables, 1,677 uh, variables and 627 equalities. And the third one was a LP formulation of TVL1 denoising. So when replacing the total variation by some anisotropic total variation, you can uh, write it as an LP problem, and we applied it to a reasonable large image so that we had around 800,000 unknowns. 
So the first observation is for these small problems, we cannot beat the imperial point solver. It's no, no chance. So the imperial, interior point solver takes only 0 0.01 seconds here for this problem. Here it's also very, very fast. And the primer dual and the preconditioned are, of course, slower here. So the, in, for this first problem, the preconditioned primer dual algorithm uh, yeah, is about, how much is it? Three times faster than the pre, uh, primer dual algorithm. But for this badly scaled problem, the preconditioned primer dual algorithm is much, much faster here, as you can see. 0 0.6 seconds versus 270 seconds here in this case. And for the large scale problem, it was quite um, interesting to see that we can very, very easily outperform an interior point solver. So it only takes 15 iterations, but each iteration takes so long that in summary, we, it takes 1,700 seconds to compute this LP, large LP problem. And the primer dual and the preconditioned primer dual are very fast in this case here. Uh, of course, when you uh, parallelize this algorithm, maybe we can beat the interior point solver, but you know, it's only very few variables. It's even less variables than, than processors on the GPU, so it's not very reasonable. But this wasn't the point to show here. Okay, so now I come to the application section. Yeah? What do you mean by anisotropic? Maybe I write it down on the blackboard. So the isotropic, um, let's say you have u is, is your image and you have nabla u, that means it's something nabla x u and nabla y u. Okay, the gradient is a vector, of course. And the isotropic thing is, uh, I call it 2, 1, is the sum over all pixels. And here you have the square root of nabla x u i j squared plus nabla y u i j squared. This I call the isotropic. It's not completely isotropic, but almost. And the anisotropic, it's just the L1 norm, which is the sum over ij. And here you have the absolute value of x direction, ij, plus the absolute value of the y direction of uij. So, um, your k operator in most cases is degrading? Sorry? Your k operator yes. in most cases is degrading. It's degrading, yes, exactly. So it looks like k is nabla is some matrix. Here you have minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1, just finite differences. Can you say it again? When you showed the PPD algorithm? The primer dual algorithm, yeah? Yes. So, um, no, 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 the, 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 the precondition. The yes. Mm -hmm. So, for example, with this K operator. For this operator, there's no difference between the standard algorithm and the preconditioned because it's completely regular. So, it gives you the same thing as the operator norm. There's no difference. But in many, many problems, you don't have this nice structure. You have here some dense columns or whatever. And then it's, the difference is very, very huge. There's also a tiny difference on the boundaries, which could make a difference in practice. You're right, yes. Because at the boundary, you somehow say that the gradient is 0. That means the last thing here is 0. So there's a different row and column norm, of course, yeah. But I, I checked this. It's not too huge, the difference. But you're right. <laughs> Okay, so the first application. So you can interpret the total variation maybe as, as the simplest form of, of structured sparsity. Sparsity in this case means the positions where the gradient jumps, where there's a discontinuity is jump. So I only have a few positions in the image where it jumps. Uh, so there's no reason why not to replace your Nabla operator by something richer, for example, a wavelet transform or a curvelet transform psi here. So the model basically stays the same, just replace your nabla operator by something more rich. So then the model looks like this. This is also very related to the basis person problem. And the settle point formulation looks like this, so we just dualized this L1 norm here. So now I show an uh, image in painting uh, example. This is the original image, and 80% of the lines were lost. So for compressed sensing, this is very bad because from compressed sensing, you know, it should be randomly. So this is not completely randomly because you always remove one complete line. When you do total variation in painting, it looks like this because it just minimizes the 
uh, sum over all level lines, uh, the length of all level lines in the image, it's very bad. And if you use a curve transform, the image looks like this. So the same input, but a better uh, K operator gives you this. So it means the, the curve transform might be a better uh, prior for natural images. So when you compare it, so you see, for example, here, the thin trunk, it's much, very much improved. Okay, another very, very important model in computer vision is the POTS model, which has been used in huge number of applications like image segmentation, scene labeling, stereo, optic flow, whatever. Here is a continuous formulation. Um, in the continuous setting, the POTS model is written as, given an image domain omega, I want to find a partition of the image domain into sets EL, such that the union of all sets should give me my image domain, and they should be pairwise disjoint. So it means there is no overlap and no hole in between. Um, and the POTS model consists of minimizing the sum over all boundary length or perimeters of these sets, plus the integral over some given uh, weight function FL here for each set. Uh, okay, so a convex representation of this non-convex uh, model is the following. Um, you introduce labeling function theta L, so it's between zero and one, this labeling function, it's relaxed so that it can take intermediate values. So the data term is easy to rewrite, it's just theta L times FL. If theta L is zero, then FL is not counted. If one, then it is counted. And some term which should measure the boundary length. And then it's subject to this constraint, it should be large equal to zero, and the sum over all theta L at one point should be equal to one, of course, that you, that's the usual simplex constraint here. So note that for K1, you exactly can recover binary image segmentation that is graph cut, for example. Um, the most straightforward relaxation is exactly to use the total variation independently for each of the labeling functions. This had been proposed by Christopher um, and uh, Gallo, Fram, and Nitam, and 08, as uh, Christopher Zach, I mean. And a better uh, relaxation was proposed together with Antone, Daniel, and Horst, CVPR 2009, so which is slightly more difficult, as you can see from here, but it's, it's nothing less than a better uh, relaxation of the boundary length here. So here's a comparison. Uh, this is the famous triple point problem. So given this boundary datum, you want to do something like an in-painting of this gray zone here. And with the simple relaxation of Christopher Zach, it gives you something blurry here. So it gives you not binary values, meaning uh, the relaxation is not tight enough. And our tighter relaxation gives a exactly or almost exactly a, a binary decision here. So this is, of course, subject to the discretization error here. Uh, Here's the four-level problem. Uh, what do you think, how, how does the reset look like? Who has a guess? Only these guesses are allowed to don't know it <laughs> prior. What do you think? Gray pyramid? That's our, that's our no, no, for, for, for our approach. Three circles. Uh, what do you mean, three circles? It's like four half circles. So it looks like this. So it gives you three, uh, two triple junctions because it's known from the mumford char problem, so the POTS model is a, a, a special case of the mumford char problem, that only triple junctions are allowed. There are no four junctions. Only triple junctions with 120 degrees are allowed, and this is exactly recovered by this POTS model here. So it's not possible that all four phases meet in one point here. So here's an example for, yeah, uh, white gray matter segmentation of a brain. Yes? Can you go back? Yes. Uh, if you just shift the blue line one pixel aside, and then there is no four junction. What would be the result of your algorithm? What do you, what do you mean? You draw the, the squares such they meet, they form not a T junction but a, a cross. What happens if you shift one of the lines? You mean this line here? Yeah, by one pixel, so that there are two T junctions, one pixel away. Would that uh, I think it will give you the same, so it's so pretty it's stable. Minimizing the path length, basically. Yeah, it's, it's a standard tree problem, basically. Yeah, it's a spanning tree problem. Yeah. So this exactly minimizes the sum over the total interface length. So you will always find 
the, mi the minimum interface length here. And shifting this one pixel, I don't think it will change too much, yes. So this is one uh, image segmentation example for medical imaging, so you can easily uh, segment this into one, two, three, four phases here, and then you can recover as an approximation of image here. This is an example with 16 labels. So what is different to graph cuts here is that, uh, for example, using the alpha expansion, we don't do solve a sequence of binary problems. We uh, solve the complete problem at once with the primary dual algorithm here. So this is always something very nice. This is the triple junction in 3D. So we take a cube that has six faces, and we fix uh, always two faces to one label. So two faces were white, two faces were black, and two faces were gray. And this is the final result of the interface, and uh, drawing one slice through this final volume gives you exactly this thing. And this is a rendering of one of, for example, white. It, the, binary, uh, the final result uh, is consist, consists of three of these objects here, and you can plug these three objects together to recover the, the cube here then. So here's another example for stereo. You, as mentioned before, you can, can use the POTS model for stereo as well. Uh, here is one example for the Tsukuba data set. It has 64 labels, so sub-pixel accuracy it takes about 7.7 .7 seconds on a Tesla GPU to solve it. And here, even more labels, it's 256 labels, and uh, it's about 170 five seconds on a, on a Tesla GPU to solve the problem here. So, so uh, the next application is optical flow. So as you all might know, it's one of the central topics in computer vision is optical flow. And the idea is to compute a vector field that describes the projected motion, the projected 3D motion of the objects onto the image plane. And it should give you a per pixel motion, so to say. So, here you see one example. I'm holding a book in front of my face and it, it moves and it's very easy for you to see, okay, there's a rotation going on and this is what the algorithm can compute and you can even see that the algorithm is not perfect because it cannot decide whether the background belongs to the object because there's no texture or it does not belong, which is easy for a human, which, okay, say this is the uh, white uh, thing in the background which does not move and this is a, just another representation of the flow field using a color coding scheme, standard thing in, in computer vision here. So the hue is something, the direction and the saturation is how fast it moves. So uh, basically the optical flow is computed here in, in this algorithm uh, using the linearized brightness constant assumption. That means your main assumption is that the intensity of a pixel does not change. That means the intensity at some position x and some time t is equal to the intensity of the moved pixel s plus v, v is the flow, at t plus 1. So when linearizing this, you end up with the so-called optical flow constraint or linear brightness constancy assumption here. This is the time derivative and this is the spatial derivative here. And um, you have to do this around some pre-given point v0 and the linearization, of course, is only valid in a small neighborhood around V0. So what we used in the paper is a slightly improved linearized uh, optical flow constraint where we say, okay, it's very likely that the intensities might change, but we think, uh, we assume they only change smoothly, and we consider this uh, modified optical flow constraint where we say, okay, it should not be equal to zero, it should be equal to minus U or plus U equals zero here. Oh, okay. <laughs> now I have many, many pictures. So it's no, no more formulas, or almost no formulas. This is one example of the optical flow. This is one of the input uh, images uh, of the Middlebury database. This is the ground truth flow color coding. And this is what the algorithm gives us. And this is uh, the intensity changes of the improved optical flow constraint. Here, you see here, there are some shadows which are here recovered exactly. Here. So I have a demo here because this can be computed in the GPU in real time. I hope it works. Let me just decrease the number of iterations here. So, so here's the input image. Maybe I should close this one. Oh. 
research code. Okay, I will not close it. <laughs> okay, maybe I just show you the color coding. So here, this flickering comes from, from the adaption of the camera. You see when I move uh, the color coding, if I increase the regularization parameter, let's say to 200, it becomes much more noisy. And if I decrease it to, let's say, 20, then it is much more smooth. So the flickering really comes because the USB camera uh, somehow adapts to the change in light. It's the flickering of the lamps here. So and here it runs. Now it's on this laptop, it's 10 frames per second for 640 times 480 here. So on, on the desktop GPU, it's five, six times faster. Okay, so now I come to the last application, which is uh, online 3D reconstruction. So what we do is we use the PTEM framework of Kleiner Murray to track the camera in real time. And we, based on the keyframes provided by PTEM, maybe you're all familiar with PTEM, uh, we compute stereo images using the optical flow algorithm because you can restrict optical flow to stereo. And then we do a volumetric depth map fusion approach, which we developed together with Christopher Zach. Uh, and the basic idea is you have a volume and your surface is represented as the assigned distance, so as the zero level set of assigned distance function, and you take all your range images obtained by the optical flow algorithm and you um, construct sine distance function based on this range information and then you do a, a denoising of all the sine distance function to 3D volume. So basically what we have is for each voxel holds a histogram of depth, uh, uh, distance hypothesis. We have a histogram of 10 bins. And then we have this TVL1 energy. This exactly minimizes the surface area because the total variation is known to minimize the surface area of the final 3D reconstruction. And this is just the L1 distance to all bins of the histograms. So this is a very nice scene. So it's highly textured, so it's easy to compute. This is how the sine distance function, the volume looks like, and this is how the uh, final surface looks like. Okay, I also have a demo for this. So here on the, sorry, here on the laptop, um, I have to decrease the resolution of the, of the volume, of course. So this is now, Everything computed online, it's just the video instead of, the, of a camera input. So this is now the tracking of PTEM. And unfortunately, because I only have one GPU in the laptop there, sometimes it will stop because uh, computing on the GPU blocks uh, representing something on the screen. So now, uh, while you're moving, it starts to reconstruct okay, this the, the 3D scene here. Okay, here we go. And when it gets more input data, more keyframes, you can compute more range images and the TVL1 regularization is computed on the GPU while new range images are constructed. So if I think it's too noisy, then I can decrease the regularization parameter here and then it should be a little bit cleaner. I also can have a better Surface interpolation it looks nicer. So and here you see the thread work. So it gives the GPU much work to do. And this bar shows how many range images are still to process. So and it can deal with cone cavities, as you can see, like this door here, Brandenburger door. Yeah, that's it basically. So everything is computed with this primal dual algorithm here. So maybe I stop here, come back to. To my slides, sorry. Okay. So you probably conclude now. Yes, I am now with the conclusion. So I've presented a first-order primal dual algorithm for convex saddle point problems in computer vision. 
Uh, and it comes along with global convergence rates for different problem classes. And I also proposed a simple preconditioning scheme which allows to use the algorithm in a plug-and-play fashion and simply try it. Yes, thank you.